if you care about the future of American politics, if you care about the future of American conservatism, in fact, if you care about the future of the American Republic, then there's one book that you absolutely have to read. It's called The Right, The Hundred Year War for American Conservatism. And it is my great pleasure today to be joined by the book's author, Matthew Continenti. Matthew, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Now, I, I read your book, um, and I have to say, there's a lot in it that I found extraordinarily illuminating, not just about the current state of the conservative movement in America, but about the past. My generation tends to think of American conservatism in terms of Ronald Reagan, but your book almost suggests that Reaganite conservatism is an aberration. Was it just an aberration? Well, <clears throat> I think it was um, unique <laughs> in a few ways. Uh, one, uh, Reaganite conservatism um, came to power during a unique historical circumstance, which was the Cold War, um, the fight against the Soviet Union and world communism, uh, which really begins in the aftermath of World War II and then comes to a uh, successful conclusion uh, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. And that is a, a, a defined historical experience, right? Um, and uh, the conservatism that existed in the Cold War was in several respects different than the conservatism that preceded the Cold War and that came after the Cold War. I would say too, Another way in which the Reagan conservatives were unique was in the character of their leader. Uh, Ronald Reagan was a very unusual man. He was almost completely self-contained. He didn't allow really anyone into his innermost feelings and self. There was always kind of a distance between him and everyone around him. Uh, even Nancy Reagan didn't quite get to the the inner uh, peace of her husband. But what that allowed Reagan, uh, that detachment, was a confidence in himself and a confidence in his principles. And those principles were remarkably continuous over the course of his public life. A belief in American exceptionalism, a belief in human freedom, and a belief that um, Individuals have the right to pursue their own destiny. And if government gets in the way, then government should be uh, reduced and um, barriers should be lowered for the individual to achieve their uh, innermost uh, purposes. Um, and Reagan, of course, was a rock ribbed anti communist as well. So I think in the nature of the historical moment, and in the nature of the leader, yes, you can say that Reagan conservatism was unique, something of an aberration in the hundred year story of the right. If, if the Reaganite period of conservatism was the kind of the high watermark, in, in order to kind of get there, you shed some fascinating light on how people like William Buckley and, and, and others built this movement. And it wasn't a foregone conclusion. They, they almost consciously fused Christian traditionalism with a belief in the free market. Um, tell us a little bit about how they did that before we go on to talk about how that may be coming apart. Well, I, I should start by saying that for William F. Buckley Jr., the founder of National Review Magazine and in many ways the founder of the post-war conservative movement, um, it, it wasn't a conscious decision to marry uh, devout Catholicism with uh, free market economics. It was, in a way, in his in his blood, uh, in his in his heritage. His father, Will Buckley, was also a devout Catholic and was also a laissez-faire market capitalist. And the younger Buckley, Buckley Jr., was brought up in a home where those two belief systems were not seen as incompatible. And so um, even though uh, we've had a long running debate on the right about how uh, there, there are theoretical problems in combining social conservatism, religious conservatism with an embrace of the market, 
uh, those theoretical problems often aren't visible in practice <laughs> or in the person of someone like William F. Buckley Jr. or for that matter, someone like Ronald Reagan, who also had a very serious set of religious beliefs. Um, but let's talk about institution building. I think the post-war, that is the post-World War II American right, recognized just how on the margins of American politics and society it was in the aftermath of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And so there, it was a conscious decision to build up institutions that could propagate um, the belief system of the emerging conservative movement and also educate the next generation of leaders to carry these ideas uh, about the importance of uh, social order, private virtue, as well as market capitalism, anti-communism, into the political sphere. And so whether it was institutions like National Review Magazine or Human Events Newsletter, or um, institutions like the Intercollegiate um, uh, Studies Institute, uh, it was originally called the Intercollegiate Society of Individualists, ISI, um, whether it was institutions like uh, the Mont Pelerin Society, which uh, Frederick Hayek created in the aftermath of World War II, uh, or even um, something like Young Americans for Freedom, much more grassroots, politically oriented. That period between the end of the Second World War and, let's say, Barry Goldwater's uh, run for the presidency in 1964, so about a 20-year period, um, was uh, just a renaissance of institution building on the right. Um, of course, today, there are lots and lots of institutions, so a, a very crowded field. I'm talking to you from Mississippi, where we have a, a number of free market think tanks in just one state. Um, you can't move around uh, DuPont Circle in, in Washington <laughs> without tripping over um, think tankers. But are there any that you think are doing anything particularly good and particularly important? Um, and do you think there are things that we in the think tank movement need to do differently? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, of course, uh, I belong to a think tank. I'm speaking to you today from my offices at the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm very proud of the work. One of those great of, institutions. Yep, uh, I'm very proud of the work of AI um, in foreign policy, in uh, social policy, domestic policy, economic policy. Um, and there are now, in the post uh, presidency of Donald Trump, there are now new institutions on the so-called new right, which are trying to formulate policies that carry on the legacy of the Trump administration. I think of an institution such as American Moment. I think of the national conservative movement, uh, the conferences that are held um, on an annual basis, organized by the Edmund Burke Foundation and its leadership uh, Yoram Hazoni and Christopher DeMuth. Um, uh, I think right now, the right is in an unusual place um, because it has gone through the experience of the Trump administration and is still trying to um, interpret the meaning of that experience. And so uh, uh, there's a lot of creativity going on um, there is uh, new thought. Uh, if you look at, say, the um, family uh, policy proposals uh, by Mitt Romney, uh, if you look at, say, some of the um, uh, economic uh, policies um, that are orient uh, oriented toward our relationship with China that Senator Rubio has proposed, for example, um, there is policy work being done that's very interesting. And the, the, the biggest change on the right in recent years has been um, a change in attitude. Um, the right now feels as it has to be much more aggressive in fighting the left that is dominant in many of our cultural and even now business institutions. Um, and so that posture is not something that you can kind of come up with in a think tank. It, it has to be practiced. And I think that's why um, many um, uh, figures on the right are looking to Governor DeSantis of Florida for leadership. 
I also noticed too that the new president of the Heritage Foundation, Kevin Roberts, I think is moving in that direction, being a little bit more uh, forward about the cultural agenda and fighting um, wokeism uh, wherever it appears. It's, it's interesting because when I started in this role 18 months ago, I thought that an economic remit was by and large going to be our focus. But I've come to realize that actually the battle for the future in many respects isn't just related to questions about increases in per capita GDP and, and, and deregulation and tax cuts, important though all of that is. There's a fundamental debate about the American story, the American narrative, American history. And it seems to me that as a think tank, we have to speak to that. We have to have something to say. And in fact, we're working on a, a, a series of a, 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 called the uh, America Explained series to do precisely this, because I wouldn't quite say we're engaged in a culture war, but the front line is very different to where it might have been in sort of 1982, 83. That's, uh, I think, very true. Um, you know, with Reagan um, and Reagan conservatism, the fight was over the size and scope of government. And communism, of course, the most extreme example of a totalitarian government that is all encompassing uh, and uh, crushes the freedom of the individual. We seem in this period to move on to a new era where the argument is really over what it means to be an American. Uh, what is your view of American history? How do you treat uh, American symbols or statuary? Um, what, what should you be proud to be an American? What does America's role in the world mean? Uh, and how does that relate to your uh, idea of American society? These are the live questions today, not so much about the size and scope of government. It makes for a cultural debate. It also makes for a much more adversarial debate uh, between the two sides. And um, that is something I worry about quite a bit. I can tell you as a, a fairly recent arrival to America, I've only been in America for 18 months, um, as you can tell from my strong Southern accent. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, there's not a morning I haven't woken up in America and been grateful for being here. Um, as an outsider, I think I see with a clarity that sometimes Americans don't always have. I, I see with a clarity just what an extraordinary country this is. I mean, it's, it's just, a, 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 it is the greatest country in the world. It's without doubt. Um, I, I, I think making sure that the younger generation understands that and appreciates that. You know, no, no country is perfect, but my goodness, America is a lot more perfect than pretty much any other country that's ever existed. And I think making sure people realize that is, is very much um, part of our mission as, as, as the right. Uh, so go ahead. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and of course, the immigrant experience uh, is a continual reminder of American greatness. Uh, I recently uh, came across on Twitter an interview with a Chinese strategist who was asked, you know, is America in decline? And this Chinese strategist said, when there isn't a two hour wait in front of an American consulate for a visa, that's when America will be in decline. And I, and I thought that was just a perfect moment of how, in this case, a, a spokesman for our adversaries sees America more clearly than the American intelligentsia and media. Now, I'm interested in what you might have to say about the relationship between the right and mainstream opinion in America, because this is, I think, an area where perhaps the conceit of the right uh, means that they don't perceive themselves quite how middle America sometimes sees them. I, I'm fascinated, for example, in the book at quite how strong the America first sentiment was. And it's not really until Japan attacked America that that was overcome. We see it again today where attempts, in my view, quite sensible attempts by Joe Biden to support Ukraine are met with, you know, vociferal hostility um, where people are saying, you know, why, why are you spending money arming um, Ukrainians? How uh, it reminds us that our views on America's internationalist role, perhaps views on the free market, maybe even views on free trade, 
which are taken as textbook by many on the right, they might actually not have that deep uh, uh, following amongst middle America. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think there's something to that. Um, just middle America as a geographic space, the Midwest uh, has typically been the more isolationist part of, of the country when you look at uh, voter sentiment toward in involvement in the outside world. Um, and we, I would say is that um, before World War II, the right uh, was very uh, Jeffersonian in its belief in small government uh, and uh, beginning to be um, more Jacksonian in its sense that, uh, you know, if America gets hit, then we hit them back. But otherwise, we don't really care about what goes on. Um, the, the, the Cold War and the threat of global communism turn, made the right, uh, I'm using, of course, Walter Russell Mead's framework here, uh, more Hamiltonian, more interested in building the structures uh, throughout the world that would enhance American prosperity and freedom. Um, uh, think of alliances such as NATO, the Marshall Plan. The IMF um, and the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, things that the, the Cold War right supported right? Because they were a means to defeating communism. Um, and it also, the Cold War also did make the right more Wilsonian, more idealistic, more in, um, more uh, interested in spreading democracy and discussing the value of human freedom. I should say that that Wilsonian strain was always highly contested on the right, deep suspicion about it. Um, because the right does tend to be nationalist. It does tend to look inward. Uh, it tends to be very skeptical of uh, overseas entanglements. Um, but during the Cold War, this change in complexion, leaning more toward the Hamiltonian and the Wilsonian aspects of the American political tradition did take place. With the dissolution of the Soviet Union, however, I do think we can see a reversion to the mean and that is the Hamiltonian and Wilsonian aspects of the right began to fade and they were revived under President George W. Bush, but the experience in Iraq um, in particular, I think uh, in a way accelerated the end of Wilsonianism in the Republican party and in American conservatism. Um, and uh, of course, with the changing nature of the Republican coalition, uh, the Jacksonian element, which tends to be uh, very present in places like Mississippi, uh, throughout the South and into Appalachia and parts of the Midwest. Um, there too, it's a sense that, you know, America should be strong. America should be powerful. You shouldn't want to mess with America. And as long as you mind your business, we'll mind ours. That's the Jacksonian feeling. Um, what that means is that uh, for most of the time, in the absence of a strike on the United States, the Jacksonians are going to be very wary of getting involved overseas. Do you think looking ahead that increased geopolitical competition with China? I mean, I, I, I grew up thinking that China was going to um, become more Western. And I, I realized with their appalling behavior towards Hong Kong that actually, no, China is reverting to a kind of Ming tradition of top down tyrannical governance which I think will eventually stifle growth and innovation in China. But one of the consequences of that is going to be, I think, uh, a, a fundamental great power competition between China and the United States. Do you think that geopolitical competition will, in a sense, recreate the conditions for conservatism that they had during the Cold War? I do think that um, opposition to China and the People's Republic and the Chinese Communist Party in particular, um, it does help unify the American right. And however, I don't see China uh, taking the place of the Soviet Union at this point. Um, the, ex the experience of World War II, um, going out of World War II where you have the mass mobilization of American society. Um, you have the collapse of the British Empire, um, the beginnings of it anyway. Um, the political dismemberment. 
Yes, yeah, yeah. It took a took a decade or so. Um, the um, the the physical proximity of the communists. That is to say, Americans were in West Germany. And on the other side of the folder gap stood the Red Army. Right? Um, the fact that millions of Americans could trace their ancestry to nations under the dominion of the Soviet Union, the so-called captive nations of Eastern and uh, Southern Europe, right? That made, uh, and then of course the just the. The, the constant threat of nuclear war in exchange, Khrushchev saying, we will bury you, right? That, that didn't just shape the American right. It shaped America and structured it, the world politics for about uh, 45 years. Mm. We're not there yet with China. Mm. China is far away. Taiwan is far away. Hong Kong, far away. Um, the demographics are different, right? Asian Americans are the fastest growing population in the United States, but they are still a rather minuscule part of the overall uh, demography of this country. Um, we're entangled with China economically. And one of the great tasks I believe of the next decade is finding a way to disentangle ourselves, to remoralize our economic relationships with China. Um, and then the the, this, the perceived threat hasn't manifested itself. You would think that the pandemic would, would have been that threat, right? This global pandemic that caused such catastrophe. And indeed, beginning in 2020, we do see a hardening of Americans' views toward the People's Republic of China. But it's still not it's still not there. Would an invasion of Taiwan do it, perhaps? But as I say, it, it's it's a long way away. Um, so uh, I, I think even though it serves a unifying uh, role on the right, um, it's still not the same binding force that anti-communism vis-a-vis the Soviet Union was. So China may be seen as a peripheral rivalry rather than an existential threat. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, but but uh, I do think that there is a lot of work being done at the elite level to persuade people of the nature of the China China threat, and that I think will will filter uh, down. I think we're going to have a big debate in the Republican Party over the next two years mm -hmm. over which theater should take precedence. Should we continue to um, us to fund the Western alliance to the degree that we have, continue to carry so much of the burden in terms of financial and military assistance to Ukraine and its fight against Russia. The NATO strategic concept pointing out that Russia is the primary threat, though mentioning China as well. There is today on the right an Asia first movement, uh, a movement of foreign policy thinkers and defense analysts who say that Europe should be deprioritized and that more of our resources need to be shifted to East Asia. Now, I happen to think that they're wrong. I think that if Putin is allowed victory in Ukraine and beyond, that will only increase the danger uh, from China. But I do believe that this is going to be the primary debate um, in foreign policy on the right in the next uh, couple of years. I can, I can see that coming too. I mean, I think even if you believe like we both believe that Putin is a, a, a real threat to the um, uh, established order of things. Um, is it right that America should continue to subsidize the defense budgets of European countries Absolutely. so they can continue to pay themselves generous welfare benefits that no American could enjoy? Right. I know. I, I think there may be a moment of truth coming for our friends on the other side of the Atlantic, not, not least in energy terms too, having made yes. themselves dependent upon a tyrant. Um, I wanted to talk if I may, a little bit about the what you talk about the, in your book as the 21st century crisis of conservatism. Um, wh wh where do you think we are? We, we had this extraordinary phenomenon of, of Trump. And reading your book, actually, part of me kind of thought there was something slightly McCarthy-esque about, I think, the rise of Trump. Um, but of course, he wasn't just a, 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 a member of the legislature. He, he very successfully 
ran for office and, and, and won the highest office in the land, despite many so-called expert career politicians uh, competing against him. Where, where, where does conservatism stand in 2022? And what, what, what should it do next? Well, um, I think uh, conservatism is uh, in a moment of crisis and self-doubt. Um, I think it's in a moment of fracture and dispersal. I think that um, <clears throat> Trump represented, uh, on the one hand, a recurrent trend in American life, as uh, in my view as well, um, exemplified in the McCarthy experience, among others, populist leaders. But Trump also represented a shift in the historical moment. I do think that it can't be dismissed that there are other political leaders like Trump throughout the world. And you, you even with in the Reagan period, you got the sense that, uh, well, it wasn't just Reagan. It was Prime Minister Thatcher. It was Mulroney. It was uh, Cole. There was all of a sudden these figures throughout the West uh, began resembling one another and kind of working along similar lines. Begin in Israel, elected right before Reagan. Um, and now we look at the world today and the, the uh, I call them national populists are there, right? Trump's not in office. Netanyahu is not in office at them. <laughs> Either one at the moment is not in office, but um, you see Bolsonaro, right? You see Erdogan, you see, of course, Viktor Orban. Um, there are analogs throughout the world. What that says to me is the nature of politics has changed and that, that me, the right is going to change as well. And because the left has become much more um, radical, uh, in all honesty, um, it, it, has, it has created a uh, reciprocal of, uh, effect on the right. Um, and that also means that because the, the radicalism of the left right now is primarily cultural. Um, that means that the right is also going to be focused on cultural issues, getting to that those issues of nationality and identity that we mentioned earlier. So what I see, when I look at the right today, I see it slowly reconfiguring itself around this new issue set. And so if you think of, say, uh, the activist Chris Rufo at the Manhattan Institute and his um, kind of you know, laying siege to the institutions is what he calls his strategy. And very um, effective he's been too. He has been very effective, right? Of course, if you look at Governor DeSantis, right? Not, he's, he, it, he is going to stick up for himself uh, for the parental rights and education bill. And when Disney uh, tried to take him on, well, he took away Disney's tax benefits and Disney kind of, it's been kind of relatively silent lately, right? Um, you play politics, this is how it goes. Exactly. So this is, seems to be where it's headed. Now, it, whenever there's a new order of things, there are remnants of the older system, right? I mean, we're far removed from Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, but of course, social security is still politically untouchable, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there will still be Reagan conservatives. I call myself a Reagan conservative. I, uh, that's his system of beliefs is basically mine. Um, uh, and also recognizing the prudence in, and, um, in Reagan as well. Um, so we're gonna still be around. <laughs> but uh, but there's newer forces dealing with the new issues that I think are ascendant uh, in the movement and the party. And we need to recognize that this will be a coalition, yeah. right? Uh, and if and sectarianism within the right will, in my view, lead only to defeat. That's a fascinating and very eloquently made um, series of points. I, I, I had a sort of view when I was reading parts of the book that maybe part of the reason why American politics is in the state it is and that the right is in the state it is goes back to Bush the Younger. Bush, this is the hypothesis and it's um, barely, barely formed in my mind, but I'll articulate it anyway. 
Bush wins votes by creating the notion of the wedge issue. This means that in order to maximize turnout in Florida or wherever it is, you staple onto that ballot a, a secondary issue that is going to mobilize your base and get them to come and vote. This kind of provokes the left to do the same, and it creates Barack Obama. Um, you then enter this kind of pendulum of unpopularity where um, Obama, eight years of him, provokes the right to then nominate and elect Trump. That then provokes an ultra-woke AOC-riddled left to produce the guy we've got at the moment, who I think by many measures would not otherwise have got there. Is there not a danger that actually unwittingly the Conservatives have triggered this tit for tat tribalization of the American political process? And, and we're kind of reaping what we sowed and we, we need to actually be prepared to stop those tactics unless we want people like AOC and you, know, you can afford to lose against Jimmy Carter. You can afford to lose against Bill Clinton. Yeah. I'm not sure you can afford to lose against some of these people who will change the very architecture of the Constitution if they got their way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> great, great question. Look, I think that there is a uh, back and forth to American politics in general. Just It just does seem to be the case that the parties rotate in and out of power. It's very unusual to go three consecutive elections uh, at the presidential level with one party winning. That's what made uh, George H.W. Bush's election in 1988 really seem like it was an election for Reagan's third term, which, you know. Um, so there is that general back and forth. I would point to the presidency of George W. Bush as inaugurating our current moment in a slightly different way. The first is that uh, Bush ran in 2000 as essentially Republican Clinton, minus the personal baggage. Bush's whole idea of compassionate conservatism was meant to mirror Clinton's triangulation in the 1990s. That is, Clinton successfully adopted many Republican conservative causes as his own. Bush wanted to make sure that voters understood that he... Um, was an education president, that he cared about the environment, that uh, medic he was going to add a prescription drug benefit to Medicare, right? These very democratic issues. You know, he was going to um, increase immigration. And if you recall, I, it's hard to believe it's 22 years ago, the Republican convention in Philadelphia in 2000, right, it was, you know, it was diversity, equity, and inclusion. It was uh, multiracial, multi-ethnic uh, fest, and they were dancing the Macarena and everything, right? So Bush pursues his strategy, but he doesn't win the popular vote. And we get Florida, and we get the Supreme Court's involvement. And when the Supreme Court ended the recount uh, in Florida, that essentially um, polarized the Democratic Party. They did not believe Bush was an legitimately elected president. And then 9-11 happened and Bush becomes a war president. And that too just continues the polarization, mm -hmm. right? So you have Michael Moore's movie, Fahrenheit 9-11, all these conspiracy theories about Bush. There were articles written for the uh, Harper, uh, Harper's Monthly and after Bush won re-election in 2004, an election when he did win a majority of the vote, the last time a Republican won a majority of the vote, that was 18 years ago, um, saying that he, you know, there was a conspiracy there. That was the whole diebold thing, right? So this is all of the stuff that Trump said has been had been said by the left years before. Um, and then his second term goes disastrously. From the botched Social Security privatization in the spring of 2005 to Hurricane Katrina in the autumn of 2005, to the um, backlash against his immigration proposals, to most importantly, the fact that the war in Iraq went south very quickly beginning in 2006, and then culminating in the disaster of the financial crisis. Uh, Bush's second term is one of the least successful in American history. Ironically, his first term was one of the most successful. So he had 
he had alpha and omega there. It's the experience of the Bush's second term that gives us Barack Obama. And then Barack Obama produces two things. One is the Tea Party, which is essentially arguing not just against Obama, it's also arguing against Republican elites, right? And which defines, I think, uh, the Republican base to this day. The other thing that Obama did, typically the, the, the immediate precedent was Clinton, right? Clinton comes into office, Democrats always campaign as centrists and then govern as liberals and the public always rebukes them for it, right? The public rebuked Clinton for it in 1994. What did Clinton do? Well, he decided, you know what? I'm going to govern as a centrist. And he became extremely popular in the country, did pretty well under him. And, and I happen to think it actually makes him a pretty good... <laughs> in, ret in retrospect, that he had his faults, as we all Balanced know. Budget. Yeah. And in fact, in many ways, he, as I say in the book, Clinton was consolidated the Reagan legacy, mm -hmm. right? Um, many of Reagan's visions became reality under Clinton. However, Obama again, campaigns as a unifier and a centrist, as all Democrats do, governs as a liberal and progressive for the first two years, as all Democrats do. The public rebukes him in 2010, but Obama does not shift course. And throughout his presidency, Obama would not move from his ideological agenda. And indeed, when his second term starts going south, he, he, has, no, he has no room to run. Um, because he inadvertently had created all these high expectations among his liberal base, precisely because he never said no to them, right? And that I think that it's the, just as the disasters of Bush's second term gave us Obama, the disasters of Obama's second term uh, are what gave us Donald Trump. Now, one of the extraordinary things about Donald Trump is that he did actually change the composition of the Supreme Court. Now, I know Reagan promised this, and in fairness to Reagan, his nomination of Bork and others were frustrated. I know that the Bushes tried this, and similarly, they found it pretty tough to get to get people on. Um, but, but Trump did it, and Trump has fundamentally shifted the ideological composition of the court. I, I'm very, very, very struck by a decision that came out very recently, and it's not the one that everyone's talking about. Um, I think the most significant decision the Supreme Court has probably made in, in decades is when the justices ruled that the Environmental Protection Agency simply didn't have a mandate to, in fact, make rules and impose them on states. Now, setting aside what this tells us about um, climate change and energy policy, it, it, it seems an extraordinary unraveling or potentially the beginnings of the unraveling of the extra um, executive arm of government, the, the administrative state. Do you think this could give the, the conservative movement a whole new repertoire, uh, a whole new agenda um, to actually run for office and seek election as part of this movement to, to wind back the federal bureaucracy? And instead of just ranting about draining the swamp, to actually do it, to, to get rid of the Department of Education, to abolish many of these um, unconstitutional bodies. I think what the EPA decision illustrates is the importance of the judiciary to American politics and governance, an importance that the judiciary should not have. <laughs> this was a creation, really, of the judiciary uh, in the 20th century, as well as um, a creation of the Congress, in particular liberals in the Congress, uh, who wanted to fob off all the hard decisions to the bureaucracy, to this so-called fourth branch of government, which is unelected and therefore unaccountable to the people. What the Supreme Court has done this term, it seems to me, is repoliticize American life. Say to the people that because of our constitutional system, you have to decide. You have to elect representatives who will write laws. You know more of counting on the judiciary and the bureaucracy to save you from the tough choices involved in self-government. I think this is a remarkable moment. Um, it, shows, it shows, one, the fruition of, of a multi-generational struggle to shift the 
orientation of the federal judiciary. That struggle cannot be abandoned, right? I mean, it, it just, it, to me, it just is a reminder of the importance of the judiciary and the conservative legal movement. It's also a sign that, you know, what, what is called judicial engagement, that is to say, you know, judges shouldn't be um, resistant to saying, you know, this isn't in the constitution. Uh, I think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a good term for the advocates of judicial engagement as well. Um, and so uh, it shows the importance of placing judges on the bench um, who are going to be guided by the original understanding. And I'll just say the um, one thing that made Trump successful where uh, Reagan and the two Bushes didn't quite get there um, was the fact that weirdly the nature of the primary in 2016 forced Trump to basically outsource his nominations to the Federalist Society. And the Federalist Society, been around since 1982, has learned from experience that you don't want so-called stealth nominees to the highest court. Because if you have a stealth nominee, someone who's just going on the court without much of a paper trail, uh, you're going to be disappointed. And that's what happened to the right with uh, Justice Souter. Um, that's what happened to some degree with Sandra Day O'Connor. She was, she was nominated for different, more political reasons, but still. Um, and so what the Federal Society said was, Trump, here's the list. These are judges uh, or people or, you know, judges, nominees to at least the uh, appellate level. What we know what they think. You're going to see the proof in the pudding, wait for them to make some decisions. When they have a paper trail, we know how they're going to judge. That's how you base your decision. And Trump followed that. And so he got three extremely well-qualified um, jurists on the bench. It, it is, I think, probably going to be um, one of the most influential shifts in the subtleties of the US Constitution, because a, a lot of people, particularly in the UK, I was talking to some journalists in the UK about this recently, they, they, they struggle with the idea that what the Supreme Court has not done is take a view on, um, say, yes. or take a view on environmental protection. It simply said, it's up to the states to do it. If, if go make these arguments in your local legislatures. And I think that that's the, the idea that America has 50 different solutions to lots of public policy problems is the secret of its success. And if America can stay true to the secret of its success, I, I think America's got a great future ahead of it. So I think it's an enormously important decision um, with huge implications and um, it, it, very, very exciting. Um, I, I wanted to just finish off by asking you um, a couple of kind of random, random questions. Um, who do you think is the greatest American conservative leader? Um, that, that's been produced. I know who my favorites are, but who do you think the American, we talked about Reagan earlier, who do, you, who do you think the great American conservative leaders are? Well, I don't think there would be a conservative movement without William F. Buckley Jr. Um, I think he is in many ways the indispensable man. Um, I would also uh, point to uh, Justice Antonin Scalia, who um, was, uh, you know, an advocate of originalism uh, you know, when it was not popular um, and whose dissents on the bench during his years as a Supreme Court justice now look very prescient. Um, and he has been vindicated after his death. I also mentioned in the book, um, Rush Limbaugh. Uh, and I don't think we can underestimate um, or rather uh, overestimate Russia's importance. Um, uh, Rush Limbaugh popularized Reaganism. Um, and for 30 years, he uh, was uh, the voice of American conservatism, attracting tens of millions of listeners. And um, so he too, I think, uh, was the, um, in the, the evangelist, right? You know, Buckley was the leader, Reagan, uh, intellectual leader, Reagan was the president, Scalia, the judicial mind, um, Limbaugh was the evangelist. Those would be kind of my four. It, it, it's fascinating that three of the four you mentioned weren't elected. Um, I think that's, yeah. that's extraordinary. I just kind of finally finish off. 
if Buckley was running a think tank, whether it was a think tank like yours in DC or one like mine at a state level, what, what, what do you think he would be doing? Where would his focus be? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I it was very important for Buckley to um, keep, uh, to protect the paradigm of conservatism, um, to understand uh, that all of its parts needed to work together um, and, to, and, and to not focus on one at the expense of the other, to not emphasize economic freedom at the expense of moral order, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, so he would be, as always, thinking about the paradigm, as he might put it, and trying to further efforts to achieve it. Um, Buckley was also very concerned that um, conservatism not be overtaken by cranks um, and uh, conspiracy theorists. He would be very, um, I think, uh, concerned about who he hired. Right. That's in, our, in today's world, you really have you can only really police the institutions you control, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think he would pay attention uh, to that. And then finally, I do think William F. Buckley Jr. would be very interested in these new currents on the right. Um, I don't think he would agree with many of them. He certainly would not agree uh, with those who wish to junk free market economics. Um, but I think he would be very interested in some of these battles and he might even admire some of the crusading spirit of uh, the younger uh, folks on the new right. You know, it's, it is hard for us to go back in time and just think about how radical William F. Buckley Jr. seemed when he appeared on the scene in 1951. He was a warrior. Um, and so I think he might be intrigued and even excited about, about some of these new energies, even though he would be very wary of um, associating them with uh, demagoguery or conspiracy theory and uh, statism. That's what I will say, build coalitions, remain decent and mainstream, but look at new ways of energizing um, and engaging. That's-, that's Yeah, what... yeah, and, and it, because it, for him, for Buckley, he would find it exciting. Yeah. You know, he was a risk taker. Uh, he, he loved adventure. That's why he sailed around the world. Uh, that's why he learned to fly. Um, that's why he loved to ski. Mm -hmm. So I think he would have an attitude of, well, this is new. This is interesting. You know, we shouldn't just dismiss it. Um, there, toward the end of his life, uh, he, was, he gave an interview uh, where he said, you know, conservatism was seeming stale to him. I think this was around 2000 he gave the interview. Uh, I don't think he would say the same today. Matthew, it has been a privilege talking to you. Um, I could have, I get the feeling, asked you pretty much any question about pretty much any topic and I would have got an erudite and thoughtful answer. So I may, if, uh, if possible, invite you back on to talk about <laughs> other things at some later date, but Anytime. thank you so much. How is the book doing, by the way? I mean, I've read it. I'm an evangelist for it. Um, thank you. What, what, have you got any events? Can people come and hear at you in person and talk to you in person? Are you doing a book? Uh, well, uh, most of the tour is over at this point. The book was released in April, and um, so we're now in July. There, I will be giving a few talks um, uh, in the coming months. I think I'm going to the McConnell Center in the autumn. I'm going to visit Charleston. Uh, but there's nothing on the immediate calendar. Um, but of course, I urge everyone to uh, buy several copies, at least, of the book. It is in multiple formats, the audio book as well, and uh, I look uh, forward to talking about it. If, if you would ever venture to Jackson, Mississippi, we recently had Douglas Murray coming and talking about his book. Um, yes. If you ever want to come to um, um, Jackson, Mississippi, I can guarantee you a couple of hundred um, keen Mississippians who will all buy a copy. So you let <laughs> Absolutely. Us all right. Thank you so Thank you much. So much. Thank you.